So welcome to the Creative Commons panel discussion on 3D scanning, preservation, access, and revitalization of cultural heritage. We're delighted to have so many of you joining us from around the world. To start, I want to give a chance to the audience members as well as our panelists, um, just a moment to introduce themselves. So please, if you can, use the chat space to type your name, your association or title, and one thing that would surprise people to learn about you. But before you press enter, just wait. All right, I'm gonna give a countdown. I'll say three, two, one, and we can all press enter at the same time, sharing a quick uh, introduction that makes it a little bit more personal for us all. Okay, I've just shared the directions in the chat. I'll give folks one more, well, a couple more seconds to uh, type their surprising fact. And then we should see hopefully a flood of of welcomes and introductions in the chat space in just a moment. Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> oh, terrific. Okay, we are seeing uh, ax throwers. We're seeing um, people who can't think of a fact to share, but that's okay. Someone from Portland who has many 3D printers. Um, we have um, someone who likes to work with clay. Um, We've got a librarian from Smith College. Great um, 3D uh, imaging waterlogged Maya. Okay, interesting. Um, we've got a chicken herder joining us. Thank you all so much for sharing a fun fact about you, a surprise. Um, someone else goes camping a lot. <laughs> Someone's very excited to be from Philly. Go Eagles. <laughs> um, wonderful. We really appreciate you taking a, a little moment now. Uh, if you don't mind, I would love for you all to also share where you are coming from right now um, by clicking on this link right here. And what you can do is grab the circle, which is the third um, icon up from the bottom on the left-hand side of icons, grab a circle and just put it on the place on the map that best represents where you're joining us from right now. I know these circles can be pretty big. <laughs> Feel free to to resize them a little bit. <laughs> this is great to see. We've got we've got the US, Europe, we've got uh, South America, we've got somewhere in the ocean right now. All right. <laughs> a little bit messy. It's just kind of fun to see um, people all working live and collaborating on, um, on something like this. Um, and also it, it helps us get to know where where people are joining. So Yes, let me see if I can put the map as background. One second. Nope. Actually, I think we're okay. We get we get the idea of where people are from. We're going to uh, switch gears now and actually hear from our, our speakers who uh, we're delighted to, to have with us today. So thank you all for participating in the map and also sharing your introductions. Today, we are really, really glad to um, have at our disposal some really wonderful speakers who will be sharing a panoply of considerations around 3D scanning as it relates to cultural heritage. So we'll, we'll hear from our panelists regarding <clears throat> the importance of open access to scans and the legal issues that can challenge access, policy implications of open licensing 3D scans, cultural and equity considerations around the origins of the object scanned, such as decolonization, restitution, trafficking, and more. Um, how museums, artists, and organizations put 3D scanning and sharing into practice, um, and more. So because we have a large, uh, a large panel today, each panelist will share about a teaser or a five-minute summary of a consideration that they think is the most important. They'll end their teaser with one main consideration or question for you to ponder. So then you, as our audience, will get a chance to vote on the topic that might um, be worth diving into a little bit more first. So we're gonna do our best to have um, as many topics covered during our Q&A, but you get to choose where we focus on first. Speakers addressing the preferred topic will be invited to respond to the first questions. So please think of your questions as speakers are sharing their initial teaser presentations and then get ready to vote. So first up, I would like to introduce Michael Weinberg. Michael Weinberg is the executive director at the Engelbert Center on Innovation, Law, and Policy at NYU School of Law. He's worked on a number of projects in the intersection of 3D, open access, and intellectual property. 
Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for pulling together this exciting event. Uh, people who know me know that I love talking about 3D and open access. And so I love it when there are people talking about 3D and open access. Um, I want to talk about a couple things in my in my five minutes. The main thing, I mean, the thing that that um, I usually talk about is are some of the legal issues connected with 3D scanning. And I think the kind of North Star thing to think about when we're thinking about 3D scanning is whether or not the, the 3D scan itself gets a new copyright and who gets to have what kind of legal control over the 3D scan, whether that, that legal control comes from intellectual property right, like copyright, or just the like the physical control of the file which in some cases is much more important than the, the copyright. And so, you know, thinking about that, I think the kind of guiding principle, if you're in the United States, we can say pretty uh, firmly that you're not going to get a new copyright in that scan. Uh, as, you, as you go internationally, I think it's safe to say, and this is a tribute to many people who are on this call right now, that the trend is moving towards an understanding that you should not get an additional or new copyright in the scan that is separate from the object itself. Um, there are a lot of legal reasons why I think that is a, a good outcome. You're just kind of thinking about how legal structures work. Um, there are also really, a lot of really good, I think maybe better in some ways, policy reasons why it's a bad idea to let the, the institution or the person who happens to have access to an object at a moment in time uh, control the digital version or the highest quality digital version of that object for the period of time that you get control for for copyright right for you know in the US life plus 70 years in a lot of places life plus 70 life plus 50 right you know many of these artifacts are in museums and those museums get to control access uh, the objects themselves many of them are in the public domain and so they're part of our collective cultural heritage and so this idea that you know, the institution that has that has physical control of the object should then get a century's worth of intellectual property style control over the use and distribution of that object is, I think, is troubling and is one that both law and policy pushes against. And so as we start thinking about legal questions, I think it's a good thing to keep front of mind for people. But I also want to say that, you know, everything I've set up to this point is kind of standard open access doctrine. Uh, and it would be and it's familiar to everyone on this call, I think has been has been familiar to us as a community for a number of years. And I'm really excited by the title of this event and how this event is beginning to expand the considerations that we as an open access community take into account. We think about these questions and think more about, you know, the community, the source communities and the, the cultural heritage and the places that these objects come from and what it means to reconcile some of the concerns that those communities have with this concept of open access. And that I think there's a real future for us as a community to not see those questions as necessarily as counter to open access, but to really see it as a success of, of the open access movement as an and as an opportunity to try and synthesize the guiding principles of open access with these additional concerns that are so often coming from people and communities who are also supporters of open access, but want to bring their own sets of concerns and considerations into that process. Uh, and it, as I said, it's exciting to me that as an open access community, we're getting better at seeing those concerns not as a kind of stealth way to attack open access, which I think there are legacy reasons to, to have that view in the past, um, but instead as, as what happens when uh, an idea becomes really successful and becomes adopted by a broader, more diverse set of people and the future for open access and for 3D especially, because it really, you know, really expands the world of the objects that are involved. Um, I think really lies in trying to understand how to reconcile all of these, all of these concerns that I, I almost say competing concerns, but I think that they are, they are just, they're concerns that need to be balanced. Um, and so 
my five minutes are up. I'm happy to talk about the legal stuff. I'm talking about, uh, happy to talk about the reconciliation. We're doing a lot of that work at the Engelberg Center or not to talk about anything and just sit back and, and listen to everyone else uh, talk about more interesting things. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and next up, I'd love to introduce Cosmo Wenman. Cosmo is a 3D design and fabrication consultant for artists and bronze foundries. He's also, uh, he also specializes in design and fabrication of tactile wayfinding installations for blind and low vision users. Wenman is an open access advocate responsible for forcing the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation to freely publish the Egyptian Museum of Berlin's 3D scan of the bust of Nefertiti. He's currently suing the Rodin Museum in Paris to force it to publish its 3D scans of Rodin's public domain works and is pursuing a FOIA action against the Réunion de Musée National to force it to publish its 2000 3D scans of public domain works in French national museums. So his professional services are at links that we'll post in the chat in just a moment, and his FOIA projects are also available here, and I'll post those links in just a second. So Cosmo, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for putting on this uh, gathering here. Um, so you did a quick rundown of the three projects I want to discuss. And the, the legal insight that I had, um, I think around 2015 or 2016, was that uh, it occurred to me that uh, so many of the most important uh, museums, particularly in Europe, are national organizations, state-operated entities, that it occurred to me that uh, it might be worth uh, seeing if uh, I could get access to their 3D scans, particularly scans that they had not published or were some for some reason reluctant to publish, if I could get to them through freedom of information laws. And uh, at that time, I had become more and more aware of the, the idea that there are extremely influential uh, institutions that have really important artworks 3D scanned, but they are not publishing the results. And so the first project that I undertook to test this FOIA theory was to uh, go after the uh, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation to attempt to force them to publish the uh, their unpublished 3D scan of Bust of Nefertiti. And it took three years of uh, haranguing them and sending lots of uh, stern letters. And they eventually saw the writing on the wall and they published the 3D scan under a uh, Creative Commons license uh, without any, well, essentially in effect without any reuse uh, restrictions, depending on how you interpret the uh, license. Um, after that, in 2017, 2018, I began attempting to get access to the 3D scans held by the Rodin Museum in Paris, and I, began a letter writing campaign and they stonewalled me. Uh, and eventually I took them before the French Freedom of Information Agency that adjudicates disputes with administrative agencies. And I got a first of its kind um, decision in my favor, uh, stating for the first time that French 3D scans conducted by uh, national museums were in fact public documents. The Rodin Museum still refused to um, make the scans available. And uh, so I've had to bring them to court. And I'm currently uh, in litigation on that. Um, I know for a fact that they have 3D scans of the thinker and several other important works. And here I'm showing an excerpt of a somewhat panicked letter written by the then director of the museum to the Ministry of Culture warning of uh, disastrous consequences if my lawsuit should prevail, um, freeing 3D scans from French national museums. And then um, last year, I began uh, a campaign to go after the Réunion des Musées Nationales, which is a very large and influential organization that is basically like a service bureau to French national museums. They do a lot of their photography for them. They manage their digital rights. They're a huge publisher. And they are expressly uh, charged with um, 
promoting and diffusing artwork throughout the world and particularly um, promoting its commercial exploitation by the public. And uh, that organization has also stonewalled me. They have over 2,000 3D scans or approximately 2,000 3D scans that they actively advertise the availability of on their websites and stores. And you can put them in your shopping cart and attempt to purchase them. And their entire presentation of 3D scans is a complete facade. It's, it's a lie. If you ask to access their scans, they simply refuse to do it. And so I brought them before the French FOIA agency and forced them by doing that, forced them to explain their policy. And it turns out there's a common theme between the German Egyptian Museum, the Rodin Museum, and the Reunion Group. And they all want secrecy of their scans to protect their commercial operations. They view public access to 3D scans as a threat to their gift shop sales and as a threat in general to their control. And that's what I'm trying to uh, attack with my legal campaigns. And, Perfect, um, thank you. Well, so my, my question for the audience is, or one of the sort of takeaways I have is, it, without getting into too much detail, it's, it's extremely clear that in the back and forth in court and in letters and lawyer letters back and forth, um, I'm not dealing with people who are making high-minded, sophisticated, um, subtle uh, considerations about cultural patrimony or repatriation or um, uh, cultural sensitivities having to do with cultural sensitive cultural topics. The institutions I'm dealing with are uh, making extremely and explicit mercenary description uh, defenses of their secrecy. Uh, the, these are business decisions uh, that are completely opposed to the um, high-minded uh, open access um, promotional materials that they've distributed to the public. The, the PR campaign is completely belied by their actual behavior when it comes to the scans that they want to keep for themselves. And so my question for the audience is, um, because this is stuff that's really going on behind the scenes, if you're involved in organizations like this, if you've seen this kind of behavior, I would love to know, I would love to have uh, some insight into what is driving that. Um, my intuition is that this might be a um, generational thing. And maybe there are people in charge who eventually need to retire out before this changes, and that might be decades away still. Or is this some kind of turf battle? Um, I want to know what it's like to be in an organization and to be in favor of open access, but to have your superiors completely uh, uh, shut that down without any um, public facing uh, explanation that makes any sense. Thank you. I tried to summarize your question in the chat, but please feel free to okay. <laughs> revise as needed. Well, that's it. That's great. I see. That. Yeah, that sums it up. Really, uh, really provocative. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have Teresa Nobre. Um, Teresa is the legal director of Communia. She is passionate about public domain and access to knowledge, and she has been deeply involved in copyright reform at the EU, e ugh, <laughs> at the EU level and at the international level. Teresa is a member of the CC community, and for over a decade, she was CC Portugal's lead for legal. So, Teresa, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, I think Michael already said um, already set the tone of the legal and 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 presented very well the the legal obstacles and um, so I will not uh, bother you with explaining this this uh, from a more global perspective but maybe I will give you some insights of the EU framework. Um, indeed, we also faced uh, the same uh, legal obstacles when we were trying to protect the public domain because my institution, so I come from Comunia, Comunia is a um, 
civil society organization and have, has been deeply involved on copyright reform from the perspective of the public domain. So we are an association on the public domain for the protection of the public domain. So we depart from uh, a definition of the public domain that is uh, cultural material that can be used without restriction, absent copyright protection. So we don't deal with other forms of uh, IP protection just with copyright, um, nor other forms of property uncommon in, in Western legal tradition. So we are uh, very much now trying to understand a bit more of those uh, forms of property uh, that uh, uh, we are not so used to in our Western traditions. But uh, to come back to the legal changes that uh, the legal obstacles that we faced in Europe and we tried to solve through this lens of the public domain and, and this idea that we should defend and expand the public domain, um, we were faced with two obstacles. Uh, one, uh, not only on the, in terms of copyright laws or IP laws, so not so much the physical property, because that's, of course, also an obstacle and, and, um, and the, the actions or the legal procedures that Cosmo has uh, um, initiated were, uh, were against that, uh, uh, that uh, restriction on access to the physical files and the physical property. But from the copyright perspective, we had uh, two obstacles. One related with uh, the protection of public domain works with other forms of rights. So imagine you have a uh, public domain defined as uh, uh, material that is not no longer protected by copyright or that was never protected by copyright because you also have works that fail the test of originality and therefore are excluded from protection. But you have these works that are supposedly in the public domain from the copyright perspective, but then get uh, reappropriated through other uh, uh, forms of intellectual property rights. So uh, sort of you are using other forms of rights to reconstitute exclusivity over those public domain materials. So that was one of the challenges. How can we protect public domain works against uh, uh, these appropriations to other IP rights? And this can be trademarks. I, I think you, you might have heard uh, two examples uh, of public domain works or one example of public domain works that were appropriated through trademarks, um, which were the drawings in the in the Little Prince by Santé Zuperi, but also uh, uh, attempts to uh, uh, get a trademark on the title of the diary of Anne Frank. So using these other rights to obtain again or reconstitute exclusivity of our public domain materials. Then you also have in Europe, at least, uh, we have in Italy, Greece, Portugal, a few Southern European countries have a sort of laws which are called cultural heritage laws that create uh, new forms of protection over uh, cultural, public cultural uh, heritage uh, um, that are already uh, or materials that are already in the in the public domain from the copyright perspective that then get protected with these other forms of laws. So um, this is one problem that Michael, I don't think you, you explored that we are facing uh, very much in Europe and we have not been able to solve that one. The one that we have been able to solve is the claims of ownership over 3D reproductions uh, uh, in the form of copyright and related rights. And we solved this uh, quite recently in, in Europe through uh, the new copyright directive, which uh, now makes it clear that faithful reproductions of visual artworks in the public domain uh, should not uh, be subject to copyright or related rights unless the material, of course, that results from the act of reproduction is original in the sense that it's the author's own uh, intellectual creation. So if it's just a faithful reproduction, the intent was to create an object that is as, uh, uh, as close as possible to the original, then there is no uh, possibility to protect this uh, with copyright and related rights. So that claims of ownership can no longer uh, be made in Europe. So we have solved that problem, 
but we still have to solve the problem of cultural heritage laws. We still have to solve the problem of other IP rights, such as trademarks, that are used to uh, prevent reproduction uh, of public domain works um, through other means that are not uh, copyright related. So uh, with this in mind, and, uh, and uh, of course, cultural heritage laws and trademark, the intent of these laws or the, the, what they try to protect is different from the concerns that come uh, from indigenous communities or uh, other Global South uh, considerations uh, that we have not taken into consideration so far. Um, but with this in mind, I, I think what we are trying uh, in Europe or at my institution right now and with, with civil society organizations from across the world to discuss is if we can have a common definition of the public domain and if it's possible to agree on a common form of protection of the public domain that takes into account this multiplicity of views, considerations and traditions in access to knowledge and culture and traditions in the management of property. So that's my challenge for this panel to discuss if that form, common form of protection and definition of the public domain is possible. And how do we differentiate between uh, cultural heritage laws and trademarks and, and these other uh, forms of property uh, that are un uncommon in Western legal traditions and that have not been uh, well represented in our discussions uh, in, in the EU and in our considerations uh, uh, on this side of the civil society in the Global North. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will try to post a, a brief summary of your question in the in the chat space in a minute. Feel free to edit it, but I, I really appreciate that, uh, that challenge. Um, okay, next up we have Thomas Flynn. Uh, Sketchfab is the largest online community for interactive 3D, allowing anyone to publish and share 3D data online just as easily as you would a video or image. As cultural heritage lead at Sketchfab, Thomas supports cultural organizations and projects of all sizes in developing and delivering 3D digitization, publishing and outreach programs. Thomas began work with a 3D with 3D at the British Museum and subsequently co-founded Museum in a Box and is also co-chair emeritus of the IIIF 3D community group. So thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. Over to you. Thanks, Jenny. I'm sorry that my introduction is quite tricky to <laughs> too many, too many words, maybe. Um, I'll quickly share my screen. Maybe <clears throat> I'll um, be switching gears slightly from, from what we've talked about um so far um but i just wanted to kind of uh, pull out some things from the description of this or you know that how this uh, event has been um uh, marketed <clears throat> and, to, and some thoughts that are on my mind so one being um the advancing 3d technologies that uh, en enable us to create um ever increasing um, amounts of 3d data so um it's more accessible than ever although far from universally so um to be able to create a 3d scan so i'm thinking here um everything from large organizations down to very small organizations who work with cultural heritage um as well as individuals who are um interested in making 3d um scans themselves so there's a big opportunity to increase knowledge regarding 3d digitization and uh, events like this uh, really help um, uh, as well as kind of um, other programs um, so increased knowledge regarding 3d digitization as well as open publishing in the cultural heritage sector and we have more and more examples of um, uh, how uh, the practice of um, open publishing um, can be very positive for cultural organizations um, and then we also should think about kind of uh, the, the the existing or rather talk about the existing and potential audiences for um, open data. You know, we're producing this stuff. Who is it for? There's obviously the question of how we produce it and what we do along the way. But um, there's a, also a why. Why are we making 3D scans available? Um, Increasing access was another theme of this event, um, and it made me think, well, where does the commons, the 3D commons live and how do people find and access it? So Sketchfab has attracted a very large number of um, museums um, who are uploading 3D scans every day. Um, there are other repositories dotted around um, online, whether that's Scan the World, Open Heritage 3D, Morphosource, Wikimedia, there are more. 
So how can commercial companies and nonprofit entities work together um, uh, to, to make sure that people know where, where to find different data? I don't think we're going to reach a point where everything is in one spot covered by one single, um, I guess, user agreement. Um, and so how can we avoid gatekeeping uh, content once it's on a certain platform? Um, on the theme of revitalization of cultural heritage, um, this idea that the affordances of 3D are, are many and they, they uh, allow us to reach audiences in engaging ways um, where, where they already exist. So whether that's on uh, Instagram or TikTok, uh, or whether that's um, you know, uh, school parties arriving at your cultural organization to uh, learn, you can create 3D printed uh, objects for them to handle. Additionally, as 3D scanning becomes less technical, um, how can the sector embrace user-generated uh, content? So people coming in and creating 3D scans of objects within um, a collection held by an organization. Um, so rather than stopping people doing that, how could um, organizations really embrace that and, and use it to achieve their goals? Um, the, the 3D model on this slide, or all the 3D models on, on all these slides um, are in the public domain. Um, but this is a nice one because it's a, a user on Sketchfab who downloaded a public domain um, scan released by the Smithsonian of a Triceratops um, skeleton, and they reanimated it. So this idea of revitalizing cultural heritage can have a very simple meaning. It's, it, it means that people can do stuff with this data uh, and bring it alive and, and give it some uh, vitality. Uh, and then this idea of this was from a, another event that happened this morning that I was involved with, and somebody used the phrase letting data speak for itself. So this idea of you have a 3D scan, you put it online, um, are you done? Is that it? Is that all that, you know, here, this is just as this is the object, uh, this is where it came from, that kind of thing. Or can it be a kind of a vector for um, uh, opening up uh, discussions around um, particular topics, and uh, I'm a fan of SIARC's guided tours and their tapestry platform is one example of how you can uh, you can base storytelling with a backdrop of 3D, but um, really what you're doing is uh, overlaying the rich um, community knowledge and cultural owners uh, knowledge uh, on top of that with video and imagery and text that uh, relate to the themes embodied in, a, in an object or a 3D scan or a, or a place. Um, this is just a, a quick kind of uh, summary of the, um, the the places in the world, or rather the locations of organizations, museums that have signed up to Sketchfab's cultural heritage program. And the reason I, I kind of show this is uh, this is about 1500 organizations. And we kind of have a very strong repeat of um, existing um, uh, uh, the existing kind of setup of cultural heritage and how it's presented. So the US, the UK, a lot of European organizations. Uh, so the, the fact that 3D data is being created can reinforce the, the, the considered norms around, you know, what is, uh, who owns cultural heritage, who gets to kind of define um, what it means and, and where it's held. Um, so my question uh, is really is how can we share knowledge and skills across the sector to realize the potential for widespread 3D digitization um, and encourage and specifically facilitate the reuse of this open 3D data to enable and amplify non-institutional narratives. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, Great. I will now turn to our, our, our last speaker, last but not least, um, Johannes Hyde-Smith. So Johannes joins, uh, sorry, Johannes uh, holds a PhD from IT University of Copenhagen and has been head of the digital, of digital at SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark, since 2014. He has recently helped build SMK's online collection, open.smk.com. DK and believes strongly in open access to cultural heritage. Unfortunately, thinks that museums are pretty great too. Thank you very much and over to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks for some great um, introduction teasers. I am here to um, bring things very much down to earth and just give you my perspective as a, a museum who are sort of uh, trying to go, go anywhere uh, in this area. And uh, let me try to share my screen also. Here we go. All right, um, I hope that works. So uh, at SMK uh, in Denmark, we are one of those uh, state operated museums, uh, Cosmo, that you, uh, that you were curious about. And we have uh, chosen over the last 
12, 14 years maybe to try to adopt what we sometimes call a sort of radical openness approach. Some other other people call it sort of naive openness, but we're, we're kind of, which is which has mainly been uh, trying to be as open as possible and uh, to try to work very hard to remove barriers and to 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 to, to sort of um, clean up the sort of weird, vague um, regime of of rights like that that was covering our materials. And 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 fortunately, some of my colleagues have been very diligent in this and have have basically figured things out. So so we are now able to 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 publish most of our data pretty automatically. So when somebody in the museum, for other purposes, create material, um, and we realize again automatically that it, this is this must be in public domain, it just gets published right away. It doesn't have to be made in order to be published. It can be made for conservation purposes, but we sort of put our tentacles into into sort of the work processes and sort of grab the material and publish it online uh, through through our API and through our um, online collection website so that has worked um well for us for a um quite some time now at the museum there are um 3d objects we call them sculptures and uh they are of different kinds there are like original sculptures such as this one this wonderful um mermaid which is in the public domain by Anne-Marie Karl Nielsen um and then there are uh a, lots of um, plaster cast copies plaster cast copies of for instance classical greek sculptures um roman sculptures um uh, that are um they're kind of a a, a contested and sort of a difficult um thing for the museum there's always been arguments about are, are these are these um sort of um sophisticated enough to, to actually show the public, or are they are they just crude copies? But there are great things about them. In in this case, one of, one is that they are absolutely out of copyright, right? They're they're like they're, they're made as copies, and these copies were made hundreds of years ago from sculptures, statues that were I don't know thousand uh, thousand years old. So they are they, they're definitely out of out of copyright. Um, so they're very they're very useful um, for us in uh, in in this way. There's also this on the, the twist that 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 some people may know that that's that that these plaster cast collections, even though they've been they haven't been treated all that nicely um, across the decades, they are in some cases um, quite quite valuable because they are in much better shape than their originals, right? So if there's, if it's a bronze statue, if it was placed in a city square. Then it uh, it may have become part, partially destroyed or deteriorated, and these copies that were made for education purposes, like in the eighteen eighties, nineties, they are sometimes in, in better shape. So they're, they're 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 kind of interesting, and they're quite easy for us to use. Um, so we uh, and also because um, they're not sort of the highlights of the museum, uh, they are in a uh, they're right now in a in a building that it's closed to the public so they're very easy to get to and we can go there and we can scan them so this is um a friend of ours john beck um who has uh who, who sometimes comes around and he, he scans lots of these sculptures and we can do a lot of them in a very in a very short period of time and we see something very interesting from a again sort of naive openness perspective that we like to adopt which is basically that more is better and uh what we see is that while even though um we have lots of 2d um 2d um photos of paintings that we have only one percent of our digitized artworks are, are 3d objects 3d um constitutes 79 percent of our downloads in 2021 which is quite amazing so each one of these scans we only have around 300 online at the moment they get downloaded quite a lot so there's just i mean th there's there's just a lot of interest and, I've, and I'm, obviously this is down to the fact that there are many jpegs on the internet there are fewer 3d objects on the internet right so it, there is more interest in high quality um in high quality 3d objects maybe but it's 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 kind of it's kind of interesting for us to, to look at these numbers and see that there's some definitely something here that we can um, that we can that we can build on. 
And um, what happens with these um, downloaded SMK sculptures? Well, people are doing um, small hobby projects. They're, they're they're printing, they're painting, they're they're they're, they're merging, they're doing whatever. And uh, they're, they're sometimes publishing these things online. Sometimes they send us an email saying, I've done this. What do you think? And we, we usually think it's pretty great. It's also uh, more um, sort of um, um, unexpected stuff, such as the uh, short film made by Italian filmmaker Lucio Arese during during lockdown, where he was, like, he was isolated somewhere and he, was, and he downloaded SMK sculptures and he made this short film. That they pretty much just won every every award there was. It seems. I mean, I don't know if he could fit more, fit more award logos onto his um, little slide to, down to the. I don't. I don't think so. It's just won everything. It's it's pretty cool and it's basically just made out of SMK stuff. And uh, we are very happy to facilitate this kind of, of reusing creativity. Why wouldn't we be? Um, so. Uh, and what we're doing now is that we're trying to, 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 to get more organized, to actually make this uh, the data more systematic part of our API and the stuff that we do to make the download work better. These are very practical um, issues. Make it easier to find, make it easier to use. Think about what format to, uh, to, to choose. Maybe choose, maybe offer a, a range of formats, qualities uh, for download. And I would say just honestly that, so this is Mid Journey's version of you know, the art museum ladder of maturity. And in terms of 3D scans, we're just at the lowest, at, at, at the, we're, we're, the, we're the person standing outside the, the, the lab, you know, not even on the ladder yet. We're just, we're just doing stuff. And, uh, and, and we have not yet sort of consolidated uh, the, the way to do this in, in terms of the organization, in terms of long-term strategy in terms of other departments uh we're trying to to get other departments interested in in this it's not happening so so we're doing a lots of stuff we're choosing as we usually do safe material it's like uh, i mean of course there are concerns that can be raised but but the um the plastic cast collection and the closed building usually uh, lets us do stuff um without raising much much controversy and uh, and and so that has been our approach to, to 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 do that and to try to get this out and see what happens and what happens it seems is that there's great interest in this now we would like to um, sort of inspire more interest and we are absolutely in agreement with those of you who said that I mean putting things online is a nice sort of start and then the real work starts right you have to uh, facilitate you have to inspire you have to exemplify and that. We're able to do that with with sort of more advanced uh, users um, and designers. I would really like to see uh, to find a way for us to inspire regular museum goers to 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 uh, to, to 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 engage with this three D material more or to, or three D scanning and just to be be, be part of this um, part of what we're doing. And I we haven't really found the right way. If we've done certain things, contests and stuff, but I would really like to, like ideas. On, on how to make this a more integrated part of the museum experience. That is my question. And thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. These presentations were wonderful. I really appreciate you also being able to condense uh, such in interesting information in a very short amount of time. So what we'd now like to do is turn this over to the audience. We're going to open a poll and get your input. So we want to know from you where to focus the Q&A first. But please know that what you vote on, you will be required to ask a question on. So the, the top vote will get the first question. So you are, you are on the hook for a question. All right, we're going to open the polls now. And I want to also note that um, we've been kind of editing the poll as people have been presenting. Um, I'd like to consider, um, let's see, Yannis' question about how we involve beginners in the, the option about um, I believe about um, collaboration. Now, let me just double check one thing and then we, we will launch the poll one second. Yep, okay, here we are, launch. And it looks like some of the edits have not been added, but generally, um, these are kind of the broad strokes areas. I think some of our edits might have been a little bit too long for the, the poll. 
The poll is already closed for you. Hmm. Is anyone else having? Okay, one second. Let's just see if we can start that again. Um, Connor, do you mind restarting that? It seems like it's open for me, but perhaps it's not. Sure, let me check. And thank you all for bearing with us as we pilot a, a slightly different approach to these panel discussions. Pilots are always uh, not without their hiccups. Relaunch, relaunch. Thank you. Okay. I think it's open now. Yep, yeah, votes are coming in. Okay, we're good. I'm not seeing the poll, but I will we'll find it. All right, we'll give folks another second or two. Um, unfortunately, I'm unable to see the poll here, but um, ah, thank you, Sebastian, for letting me know. I will hopefully be able to see the results once the poll is closed. Hopefully everyone will be able to, to see the results as well. Um, so let's give uh, folks one more second and then Connor, maybe you can end the poll and we'll, we'll all see the results. Okay, it looks like we've got about 70% have answered, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. And share results. Are you guys seeing the results now? I'm I'm still not. So <laughs> flying blind okay. here, but I will defer to Connor to just read out <laughs> what the, the top priority um, is. Yeah, number one is the fourth question, which is how museums, artists, and organizations scan and share works. How can they collaborate? Also including um, Jonas's question about uh, how to involve beginners in kind of that question. Number two is legal issues that challenge that can challenge or ultimately grow access to 3D scans. Back to you. Thank you so much. All right. So whoever voted on the, the top consideration, especially around collaboration, please feel free to unmute, unmute your microphone and um, and share a particular question that you might have for our speakers right now. I'll defer to you all first, and then if not, I will I'll jump in with a, a question in particular. I think sometimes when we put the audience on the spot, uh, <laughs> it takes a little bit more time. So I'm going to jump into one question that um, that we have in our advanced questions um, document now. But please do feel free to type a question that you have in the chat or unmute your microphone after this. And do feel free to to ask our our. Oh, I see a, a hand raised. Go yes, for it. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, one of the aspects that we should be discussing is the dis the the, uh, the difference, in fact, between an uh, original copy, a copy of a work, uh, if you just scan it like it is, and doing something creative with that three D. Uh, because I think the legal aspects and the copyright changes when you do creative work on top of your three uh, D scan. So. Is that something we should be discussing? I think it makes uh, quite a lot of difference. Who would like to, to take that question first? Feel free to jump in. Uh, I, can, I can talk about, I think, I think the answer is, is yes, right? Um, and so, yeah, as you, as you add uh, creative elements to the, the scan, then you're going to be getting into copyright territory. Um, I think one way to think about it is what is the purpose of the scan? If the purpose of the, of the file or the scan is to depict the work as accurately as possible, 
then um, certainly under U.S. law and I think more broadly and the kind of the larger policy we've been talking about, that's where the kind of new copyright is not going to be as robust and probably does not exist. Um, if the purpose of the 3D model is to do more than accurately represent the object uh, and, and build some sort of creative expression on top of it, then that's going to be where the protection is. I think in many cases, the assumption is that the scans that institutions are doing will fall into that first category, at least the initial scans. Um, they may bring people in or themselves kind of build on top of that. And, and that's exciting. And we've seen already seen examples of that. Uh, kind of, you know, Thomas was talking about letting the data talk for itself. Um, but the, the scan itself, you know, if the scan is sort of designed to represent the object, that's where you're going to be in a kind of no copyright zone. And as you get to that creativity, that's where you're going to see the, the protection. The protection will attach, you know, to the, the new creative elements in a lot of cases. Thank you. And I see Cosmo noted in the US, does the intent of the scan even matter? I, you know, I think the answer is sort of no, sort of yes. You know, I think when, when trying to understand if the scan is is kind of representational, is designed to document the object or designed to do more, you can look at the scan itself. Uh, if it was, if it went to a lawsuit in the U.S., you would probably have conversations about what the intent was, and that, that would probably inform. But the real analysis is essentially how how closely does the scan, how closely is the scan intended to map to the object? And so understanding the intent, I think, will help us answer that question, although it's not a kind of dispositive question necessarily. Thank you for that. Um, anyone have anything to add before I, uh, I pose another question to you? All right, and I see we have a couple hands in the audience. Um, let's uh yeah let's actually let's turn to um let's see i think adriana had a, a question first and then over to douglas go ahead thank you so much uh and uh yes i was also be interested interested to hear what the question is so um i wanted to build uh, upon the question that daniel just asked and not so much from a legal perspective but i wanted to understand what people think about this situation, whether, so if we imagine uh, a 3D model re that represents a reconstruction of an archeological site. So whomever created the model started almost from scratch and, and built the model on the basis of a lot of research and um, some creativity. So if we say that this can potentially attract copyright, would you still discourage this copyright from being claimed in the context of cultural heritage? So in line with the, um, Public Domain Manifesto and Public Domain Charter, is is this something that you would advocate uh, against, like claiming rights where there's been a very clear uh, contribution from the person that created the 3D model? Um, I'm just generally curious about what, what whether people have been thinking about this. Would anyone like to jump in first? I, mean, I have I have opinions about all these things, but I don't. <laughs> I encourage I encourage other panelists to jump in and make me stop talking. Um, I would say I, I think about that question a little bit as a kind of bottleneck question, right? Um, if if the if the if the digital file is created because there's an institution that has the ability to prevent other people from creating it, um, from a policy standpoint, separate from the kind of legal question, I think that's where I get especially wary about granting that digital file um, exclusive rights because only one person can kind of do it. If what we were talking about, which is someone did research and then kind of began with a blank canvas and, and built their own depiction of it, you don't have the same kind of bottleneck problem because other people could do, presumably could do that similar research and kind of build their own model that would not infringe on the original one. And so in that situation, having the having you know each one of those models protected by copyright doesn't tend to block out other people who want to do similar work. And so I have I have less concerns. I, I, I would still say, you know, if it was an institution creating that, I would want to have a conversation about them about 
kind of what their what the purpose is and what the purpose of maintaining kind of exclusive control. But for me, it would be a different question than, you know, we control access to this object, we control who got to scan it, and then that whoever scanned it gets to have some kind of exclusive right that would exclude other people from using it. There's also the consideration of the more restrictions you put on the data, even if it's all with good intent, it, the more restrictions you have, the less people are going to be inclined to even inquire about whether or not they can use it. You make it downloadable with an open license or public domain dedication, your data is going to get more people looking at it and using it and giving you feedback on what's interesting about it or showing you features about it that you didn't even notice. But if, if it's closed, um, you're, you're limiting the value of that data even to yourself. And that's something I think that kind of gets into this idea of um, 3D scans becoming orphaned just because uh, they're difficult to get to and nobody knows exactly what the answer is on can this person use it for this this end use that we didn't uh, anticipate. And it just means your data will be less likely to be used and will ultimately be less valuable. I just, I just wanted to, uh, to second, I think that's a very, I think it's a very uh, important point that that if you, if you put this material out on, under open licenses and people actually start digging into it and actually using it for their own purposes, then they will actually have a much deeper idea of what is there and they will have much more opportunities to, to be act and give you corrections, for instance. We have had tons of corrections from people looking at our open access material, just getting back to us in that same spirit, just of, of, of we're saying, we're putting this out. We don't know if it probably isn't perfect. Please get back to us. And that really helps us actually engage in a conversation with with the uh, with the public, who, who 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 will then actually take the time? Well, some of them will to actually write us and say, you know, this image just cannot possibly relate to this object. You've definitely transcribed this gothical letter in the wrong way. This is the wrong island. All this stuff probably depends for us a lot on on us being open uh, and just you know generous with our with our material. I don't think people would do that if that was not a copyright. So just to say that I agree. Thank you. I know Douglas has a question. There's one related question in the chat. So um perhaps I'll I'll ask that first to click kind of close out this this part of the discussion and then over to you, Douglas. Um, so I believe Teresa asked, what if someone were able to take a 3D model of a famous marble sculpture in the public domain and send it out to be machine carved in marble and then displayed or sold commercially? Where does this leave the museum? Um, part of what mu makes museums sustainable is the scarcity of their resources, which drives traffic. I'm curious about the long term sustainability of museums with such open access as there is a cost for curation, storage, maintenance, et cetera. So this, in my mind, um, overlaps with some of the considerations around data and providing greater access. Um, who will step in to take on this role of cultural maintenance? Um, I'm looking for a long-term systems approach. No one, who, no one who wants to see the Mona Lisa has ever not gone to the, to the Louvre because they've already seen an image of it out in the public. So this idea that the museums are going to somehow lose the public's interest because they've made uh, high quality reproductions or or images or 3D models available, I, I don't think that's well established that that has actually ever happened. And I think Jonas has some comments on that. I'm no, sorry. Uh, uh, it's just, I mean, I think I think I, I I agree with that as well, but 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 I think we we also need to work on sort of reframing this 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 conversation about uh, about um, what is I mean the cost benefit of these things because these what what we're doing I think with open access to cultural heritage is is that we're fulfilling sort of the the basic goals of many of these institutions at least the state operated institutions I mean the goal of SMK is not to make money, the goal is to actually make art matter in the lives of people, and, and and this is a very, very, even a very cost efficient way to do that. So, 
So I think, I mean, yes, of course, if, if you add extra tasks on top of the stuff we're already doing, it, you, you sort of incur a cost, but it's very cheap compared to what we're actually achieving with this with this open access. So I think we, we, we kind of need, I mean, if for us, we need to, to take that conversation and just steer it away from the physical visitor numbers that we are usually measured against and just say, well, well, we're, we're doing the right thing here, the obviously right thing. Maybe the, maybe the, the way that we get measured, maybe the KPI is wrong and, and, and we, should, we, should, we should definitely work on those. Thank you for kind of reframing it to look at what the the purpose of museums and these cultural heritage institutions actually is. That um, that's yeah very helpful. And also um, Cosmos's point about um, that not being at odds necessarily with actually seeing the the in person option at the museum is um, really interesting. Okay, without further ado, over to Douglas. Thank you for Thank you. being patient. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, this question, I think, is mostly for Jonas and Tom, is about the supply side inside museums or cultural organizations of 3D digitization. So, so far, it seems like there's been some great partnerships with, uh, if you like, uh, third party or external experts coming into, say, SMK, doing a ton of cool 3D digitization for a certain period, leaving the building, and then, you know, there's some wonderful files and 3D objects which are the result. So my question is around what do you both think is a like a sensible, smart and sustainable model for more institutions to be able to, to use 3D capture and digitization? Does it mean, for example, that the photographic studio would kind of learn skills around 3D? Or do you think that the, the partnership model, which I just mentioned, is a sensible path for the near future. So I'd love to get your thoughts. Thank you. I can uh, speak a little bit. Uh, having been one of those people that goes in and makes 3D scans and then leaves the building, um, generally uh, uh, it was one of the things I began doing uh, when I began working at Sketchfab. And um, very often it would kind of end up that you would go in because you're filling that skills gap. And there isn't a person in that organization who, um, uh, has time to learn and also has time to conduct digitization outside of their roles. You know, they're not paid to do that, but they see the value in 3D. That's why an expert will come in and um, and create some models for them. And they may be interested in trying something out. So it may be that they're experimenting with uh, what happens when they digitize something and put it online, which is um, a very valid sort of place to start. Um, one of the things that um, we um, wrote in uh, 3d.org shameless plug um essentially encourages people to um just try with the tools that you have at hand the, there are free tools open source tools um apps for your phone give it a go uh, and then the along with kind of uh you know again this is probably outside of your regular hours this is exactly what happened at the british museum when i worked there is um i was making 3d scans um before i started my day's work um, and then they found a use and, and you know, they found an audience. Um, so yeah, um, start with, with something easy and quick uh, and then get some buy-in from your organization to then establish something more concrete. And there are many examples of um, really good digitization projects. Uh, one of my favorites um, is the Malposka Virtual Museums Project out of Poland, and that's a regional digitiz digitization hub, essentially. So there are 40 plus museums uh, in the region uh, who can get their content digitized in 3D by this expert group. So uh, it's not like you need to repeat um, a 3D digitization studio in every single um, organization. You can work uh, probably regionally and nationally, depending on how you set it up. Um, I haven't seen too many examples of that, but there, there is interest in that, that form of uh, creating content. Just uh, briefly to your question, um, Douglas. Uh, so as I as I admitted uh, in my presentation, we're at the lowest rung of the uh, maturity ladder. Where where where's the where's the portable USB hard drive with with the with the files? And 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 that has been a great way for us to start. And um, we're slowly sort of um, improving our our the, the, our integrations and the way that our website works, the way the API works. Maybe the end goal is these things end up in the sort of the, the national Danish database of all museum collection data. 
maybe, but I but I think the right the right way is is, is not to start with sort of sitting down 1,200 museums and agreeing on standards. The right the right way to do this for us has been to to, to try stuff out and then slowly could get more boring and, and mature and, and 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 in the end we'll have a we'll probably have a have a good system and and then it will be the same thing as doing photography i think I mean, maybe not the same person but at least in the, sort of the same logic thank you i i also want to ask teresa about this as well um one of the things that that you've brought up is the need to to just test it out maybe to use a, a cell phone app or to just um, take these initial steps for 3D scanning. I'm I'm wondering if if there is work that community groups can do that people outside of communities can or outside of museums can can do. I know um, Teresa was our CC Portugal lead. I'm wondering, Teresa, if if you could see maybe a group like the CC chapter in Portugal doing some kind of um, pilot for 3D scanning using phones, for example, or are there other options for um, for people outside of museums to get engaged? Oh, uh, okay. So um, in Portugal, actually, um, one of our main problems with cultural heritage institutions has been uh, more of this, which we see as a sort of paternalistic uh, concern that uh, people will misuse um, national cultural heritage and so they tend to want to retain some control over the artifacts that are held by the institution so i i think more for reasons related with this attempt to shield uh, um, artifacts from alleged misuse um than than really for commercial purposes uh or for commercial concerns so i, I that's what, at least in my conversations with uh, cultural heritage institu institutions in Portugal, I've seen. So I don't know, uh, at least in Portugal, for I, I believe a, a Creative Commons community could do that, but at least for the Creative Commons community in Portugal, I think we would need first to start a, a wider conversation uh, with institutions first to attempt something like that, because indeed the, the this... Um, idea that uh, that uh, uh, institutions should retain control over how things are used and kind of a control of taste in a way also uh, what is a, a use that uh, um, that they consider to be acceptable and etc I think you know at this stage where we are that type of mindset would prevent uh, uh, this kind of interaction, but yes, I think uh, for start, I would say someone, uh, the community from CC Portugal would probably need to start from that conversation and, and then attempt to, <laughs> to go and digitize with cell phones. I think it would be amazing. I mean, we have a lot of tradition here with um, fab labs and 3D models. I don't think the community here has been so interested in cultural heritage. But maybe it's a conversation that we can start. But but again, it would need first to also uh, bring the concerns of museums uh, related with this uh, uh, um, idea of control down. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, reframing that a little bit, broadening the question a little bit, I wanted to highlight something um, a, an audience member said, um, and this goes to all um, all speakers today. I'm a history archaeology enthusiast in the general public and lucky enough to be on good terms with many professions in the field and a big advocate for open access. What can I or other hobbyists do to encourage institutions and researchers to share scans, databases, and so on? And are there organizations I can donate to or um, I can direct those researchers, institutions um, who might assist in those efforts toward? Um, or maybe um, that we as hobbyists could even volunteer at. So maybe it's not a matter of starting at um, at CC Portugal, for example, but uh, does anyone here in, in the panel have ideas for um, ways hobbyists can get involved with kind of that institutional advocacy um, element? I can say a little about that. Um, I think it very much depends on the organization. Some are very open to collaboration with 
people and, and others are not. Um, I think there are enough examples now of the positive side of um, publishing data openly that um, I think just pointing these things out, I think we, you know, we almost need a, a list of um, great things that have happened with open data. And, you know, there are examples out there, but it, it can be, you know, as a handbook for, for people to, for people for outside museums or cultural organizations to approach. That's maybe one, one thing to do. Um, I keep, a, I just pop it in the chat. I keep a, a forum thread of um, creative reuse of um, Creative Commons uh, licensed content from Sketchfab uh, on the forum. It's not all cultural heritage, but there's a lot of cultural heritage um, 3D models in there. Um, <clears throat> partly exactly because of, of what I'm saying, because I want to go and talk to people and say, how good is this? How uh, interesting is that this artist, this animator, this film company picked up um, some content from uh, uh, a museum and reused it in uh, an interesting, creative, possibly educational way. And, you know, there, there are examples across um, all forms of human expression, whether that's, you know, um, there's a, a, a chap called David Fletcher, a member of the community at Sketchfab. He, uh, his child was going to visit the British Museum. He downloaded um, 3D models from uh, the website, some from myself, some from the museum, some from Daniel Pett, 3D printed them for his kids to take along. And uh, it's such a sweet idea that, uh, you know, he has this interest in 3D, he can, uh, and knowledge of these models existing, and he can Put it to use practically and the museum itself has made 3d prints for for handling desks as well so uh maybe that's once one thing kind of like let's be better at pointing out the the positive side i also shared um uh, a tweet that i put out like um before this panel uh asking people well what what bad things have happened uh with publishing data openly um and it's very obviously very unscientific but um there aren't so many examples of um bad things happening when when data is uh, put out there and i think people have said before bad actors are going to do bad things regardless of whether your data is uh, licensed openly or or closed um and we see that at, at sketchfab as well thank you i love that idea of a um a handbook a handbook for advocacy um that points out the positive side to to doing this work and the, to sharing to um, raise more awareness. Thank you. Um, other other panelists. I can mention just one initiative that we're working on. Um, you, know, you mentioned both what people can do and, and how they can advocate, help help institutions advocate. And we have a project that we're kind of spinning up right now um, with some folks over in the UK at the University of Exeter. Uh, called the GLAM eLab, and it's it's just a landing page now. I'll, I'll send it around, but there's nothing. There's not very much there right now. But the idea behind that is that many of these institutions, um, one problem they have is that they don't have the kind of internal legal capacity to identify the works that they can scan and then create the terms. And so this is an initiative that both directly represents those institutions and helps them walk through the process, um, and then also turns all of the documents that are created in terms of in, in the process of that representation into some turnkey policies. And so hopefully, you know, as you're talking to institutions that you're you're fans of and that you they are close to you, um, is they give you the problems that they have. If they have, if some of those problems are legal problems, that that may be a path towards uh, a little bit of a solution. Thank you. Can't wait to see the the link. Thank you very much. All right. I know we've got more questions and comments coming in. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to respond? And then we'll turn to the next question. All right. Great. Well, let's let's turn to the next question. Um, we have. Um, Let's see. Daniel notes at Teresa, images of uh, famous paintings are abused for memes, but does that um, stop the use? No, nor should it for 3D either. Uh, a great comment. Um, we have, let me kind of scroll through this chat and just want to say that I agree. <laughs> just make sure. Thank you. Um, I had a quick follow up for that. So if people internally are are saying, well, maybe we don't want to make our digital assets available because somebody will misuse them, I, I can imagine all sorts of 
uses that people would, would get people flustered. But then my, my question is, okay, so let's assume that happens. The follow-up question is, and then what? what? What's the bad thing that ultimately happens that as a result of the misuse, is this a, you're going to embarrass the institution? Uh, the, the board is going to be upset? Well, what's the ultimate, you know, worst case scenario if all of the things we're anticipating happens, ha happen? I, I've never heard that. I, I can imagine that the, the grotesque imagery <laughs> that might be made, but then what? It, it sounds like ultimately it's, it, it's a political thing to me. Yeah, Somebody's I mean, but embarrassed. I, th I think it, that's exactly what is beyond, beyond, behind the, the, this uh, cultural heritage codes and cultural heritage laws. So these attempts to protect cultural heritage um, from uh, abuse or from uses that might uh, create some sort of reputational reput uh, reputational risk to the museum or even to the country. So I think the cultural heritage laws they definitely depart from this um, principle that these artifacts are representative of this national culture and 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 therefore they cannot be used at least for commercial uses so most most of these cultural heritage laws they they prevent commercial uses but not non commercial commercial uses so and they do so in order uh as i as far as i understand it i've talked with some government representatives to uh, prevent these embarrassment uses and i've i've been told that uh, you know the example is like what if if we don't put any restrictions what if people do porn with museums or cultural heritage artifacts and you know i i don't know if these radical examples happen so often um but it is where where it's coming from this uh very close association of the artifact with the culture or with the museum itself and, and somehow this is a source of uh, i also ask exactly what you ask cosmo is like what what if what's the problem why is this a matter of uh, embarrassment or why does that create a, 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 a well, who is embarrassed a risk for and who is embarrassed i mean me as portuguese will be embarrassed because someone used I, I don't know, uh, but well, that's it sounds definitely... like in practical terms, it's it's the museum administrators who are fear the reputational damage personally. Yes, I I think people curators uh, in particular, people that are very attached to their collections, feel some sort of duty of uh, guardianship over the use of the collection. Uh, but maybe Jonas is. <laughs> He's raising his hand and he wants to say something. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but I was, I was just, I would just add that I, I, well, I don't, I have never sensed any real, well, there is no real fear in 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 my organization. I don't think uh, about sort of embarrassing mis misuse of these things, and in, in 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 that in that sense, I think there is a, I think there is a maybe a worry, and I think it's well founded that when we publish our metadata our collection management metadata then people will see how wrong it is and uh, and they do and I, so i think but i think we have i've spent some time trying to frame that as a positive thing the way i tried earlier like th this is like a thousand this is like 10 maybe even more um people helping us proofread the stuff and it's yes, it's wrong, and the island is another is is the wrong one, and the, the image is wrong. It's, it's super helpful to have these comments, and 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 I think what 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 counts people down is that these these uh, errors are of course they can be construed as embarrassing, but the the the, the emails that we get with these corrections are always very kind. I, I haven't received one which is like, oh, this is so embarrassing for the SNK that you didn't know the island. It's like, it's, it's always like, oh, I think you, you got this wrong. Maybe you should correct it. And we're like, it's 30 minutes have passed since you wrote this email and we've just changed it and you were right. Thank you. And that, and I think once you realize that that is the kind of dialogue that, that you have, at least that we have with most of our users, I think that, that, that some of that fear tends to die down, to, to go away. 
it's not fear about misuse really it's it's fear about just publicizing all your strange idiosyncratic database errors <laughs> okay so I think uh, actually there's a, a very interesting question from Teresa Becker, uh, and it, it goes in the direction that I was uh, my challenge was was going is, and I have also been thinking how do you differentiate these concerns that come from you know our peers in Europe that just we believe that want to retain culture uh, control just you know for purposes that we don't see. In many cases, being valid enough to um, to um, uh, justify uh, reappropriation of public domain works or uh, providing new exclusive rights over public domain works, but there is indeed these other discussions of other concerns, and especially from global South communities on that come from a different place and 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 people that have not been heard uh, in, in these discussions and not being included. And I I think the way we, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm here just, we are just starting to learn about these issues and we are just starting to have these conversations as I was telling you at my organization, because we also want to learn how these voices and how these concerns can affect this notion that we have of public domain and how can they affect even the legal definition and the legal protections that we are trying to obtain for the public domain. I do think that, um, but but I'm open to learning. So for now, I'm departing from this idea that uh, it, it's probably not a question of changing the way you look at copyright. So copyright, it's probably needs to be uh, considered in the same way, but there are uh, other justifications that are as important as copyright and they need to be taken into account. And uh, and they are outside of copyright uh, and probably do not impact copyright itself, uh, but need to be uh, discussed because I and 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 this might affect on how we see open access, and especially for this community and the community that uses Creative Commons licenses, for sure will have an impact. Uh, but it might also be that I'm wrong, and it might have an impact on also how we define public domain and and and. Um, the recommendations that we give to lawmakers on how to protect public domain. But I don't feel qualified at this moment to, to, um, to say more about this. And I would love if someone of, of in the audience is uh, engaged in the discussions, if they would uh, take part on of this conversation and, and intervene. Thank you. And for the, the sake of the recording here, Teresa's question was, uh, for the most part, I hear the discussion centered around European art and cultural heritage. How might this affect more indigenous voices related to the use of their cultural heritage items? Are their voices included in this discussion? Um, so I really appreciate um, Teresa, you raising Teresa's question as well. I, I want to take a quick pause and note, um, one of the challenges of this discussion was in not, um, not being able to, to bring in a more globally representative set of, of voices here. And um, yeah, that is that is something that that we take responsibility for. Um, I think it is really uh, wonderful seeing the in the discussion some of the examples for perhaps complementary tools to be used with copyright tools like CC licenses, which um, are you know traditional knowledge labels, for example. So um, thank you for the the wonderful question. I want to see we have about Wow, six minutes left. Does anyone else on uh, our panel have any further ideas um, addressing Teresa's question? Maybe ways that we can uh, better include uh, voices of um, of people from the global south or indigenous voices from our our own um, lands. Would it be silly to just suggest them emailing them? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it maybe sounds stupid, but I think you've, you've got to maybe reach out to people or, you know, do, do some legwork. I think it's um, easy to, to sit back and assume that if you work at Sketchfab or Creative Commons or, or a well-known organization in certain circles that you're known very well globally. Um, so I think there's plenty of work to be done that, that is, I would assume, very straightforward. But um, yeah, I do want to put a, a quick plug. I, I put it in the chat, but I'll, I love you. I love this project, so I'm going to plug it. And the and the um, 
the recording as well for Enrich. Um, Enrich is an organization that is really deeply tied into these communities and is really deeply tied into institutions and trying to understand how to balance a, a bunch of a bunch of concerns that are sometimes competing, sometimes aligned. It's a really complicated conversation, and um, I'm excited by the work that they are doing. There, there are plenty of other organizations, but Enrich happens to be part of my center at NYU, so I know them well. They're doing just really fantastic work on how to rationalize and and bring together those con those uh, concerns. Thank you so much. I also want to raise um, Curationist as a really great organization for um, raising some of this, uh, some additional ways to engage in cultural narratives and um, raise up Indigenous voices to, to the mix as well. All right, we have about four minutes left. I wish we had another five hours. But um, I really appreciate the the thoughtfulness that everyone's raised, not just with the um, the panel um, presentations, but also with your questions in the audience. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them. I do want to leave uh, speakers a, a chance to raise any last kind of final remarks here before we close the panel discussion. So I will um, I'll field this over to I think Michael to start, and we'll just kind of go through the, the panel list. Uh, I put a bunch of links in the chat, so I won't touch on any of those. I will just touch on uh, something that I think Thomas mentioned, which is when you're thinking about implementing these programs, really thinking about designing them for to empower the good actors you want, as opposed to spending a lot of time worrying about the bad actors who will be bad, even if you put up barriers to them. Thank you. I like that kind of reframes things in the positive, just as you did in your, your presentation. Thank you. And Thomas? Sorry, my headphones are running out of battery. Um, no, I, I think um, we've we've covered so much ground. You know, I guess my hope with events like this is that um, people continue talking within the group, um, but also um, link up to other groups poking at the same ideas and uh, in the same kind of area. So, for example, the AAAF 3D community group, for example, um, or uh, the CS3DP group uh, in the US. So that you know these conversations don't happen in isolation and um, things get linked up. And good examples uh, float to the top. Thank you. And Cosmo, I meant to turn to you. Sorry, over to you. That's okay. Well, just about the the question about uh, empowering Indigenous uh, or the Global South or or less represented uh, organizations in this digital space. One thing that has occurred to me is, uh, for people in this field, I would love to see more. Um, discussion of 3D scans in the context of repatriation disputes. And I, I know that would certainly not satisfy almost anybody to receive a set of scans instead of an artifact. But um, there is, I think there's this, there's uh, an opportunity for at least uh, increasing access to artifacts that maybe are contested. And it would be an interesting turn of events to see um, patriation repatriation disputes raise the idea of returning the artifact but retaining the scan and so I think the more um, we can get around these ideas of uh, cultural sensitivities even with western works uh, that uh, you know wind up not being uh, published just because of bizarre political concerns we can get our heads around that that will enable us to um, offer more solutions uh, that might actually benefit uh, people trying to get artifacts back. Thank you. And to Teresa? Um, yes, along the same line. So um, I think it's really important for us that we uh, continue to be able to access to our shared knowledge and culture. Uh, we derive new knowledge and new culture from from this wealth of information that we call the public domain, and and in our vision, it access to it plays a capital role in the in the fields of uh, education, science, and culture. So, of course, we we believe, and I think this discussion also touched a bit on this. Believe that uh, we cannot continue to do policy uh, on 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 public domain issues without taking these other forms of uh, 
um, property that are not common to us uh, into account. And uh, I do sincerely hope uh, and uh, we are making our, our part in bringing this, these people to the conversation on what policy should look like uh, in this area. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, over to Jonas. Just a comment on how to um, get more great stuff into the public domain um i think in terms of museums holding back um on freeing 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 these resources there are many there are many weird um re reasons for this but i think one way to, to sort of work with this or work against it is to one sort of appeal to their own values right like you have have you read your own strategy have you read do you know what your what your mission actually is and this is probably very close to being it. So you, you should do this. But there's also the, the other point, which is about sort of the, the, the cost and all that stuff. And there is this 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 uh, this this thing about you know this sort of business school saying that what gets measured gets done. And and at, at least uh in, in Denmark there's a, there's there's such enormous uh focus on the I mean let's just say statistically <laughs> doubtful um attendance numbers physical attendance numbers this is the only thing that gets discussed and measured and compared and you and, and they're not particularly great i mean they're not particularly trustworthy these numbers but there is this kind of there's the need to to sort of redefine um what gets put in the annual report and to make sure that these uh that these efforts are counted and rewarded and then change will happen, at least in, in, in some institutions. Thank you. And what a positive note to end on. Uh, I really appreciate all of your, your insight and um, ideas for advocacy, ideas for even challenging the way CC does our kind of outreach for programs like this. So um, thank you for a fantastic discussion. I really um, look forward to what comes next. I um, I focus on open education, but had the the pleasure of of joining this um, this webinar and and learning so much from all of you. So um, thank you all. We'll share a recording as soon as we can, probably within the next week. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. Okay, take care, everyone. Thank you.